Welcome to this British Academy event. I'm Frahana Haider. I'm a journalist and broadcaster and a presenter of the BBC World Services Witness History Programme, which looks at important events in history through the eyes of the people who were there. Today's event is the fifth in our series titled Why History, in which we will be joined by British Academy fellows and funded researchers to discuss insights from the past to help us make sense of the present. I am delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Dominic James. Dominic is a former British Academy Mid-Career Fellow and Professor of Modern History at Keele University. He is a cultural historian who studies texts and visual images relating to Britain in its local and international context since the 18th century. Within this sphere, he focuses on the histories of gender, sexuality and religion. His most recent books are Picturing the Closet, Visions of Queer Martyrdom and Oscar Wilde Prefigured. Dominic and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit this in, via the Q&A function. You are, of course, welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in at British Academy. You can also copy in Dominic, who is at James Dominic, and I'm simply at Frahana Hyder. Dominic, welcome and thank you for joining us. Okay, the that's title great. <laughs> the title of this event is based on your book, Picturing the Closet, Male Secrecy and Homosexual Visibility in Britain. Could you tell us briefly a bit about your research mm. and how the concept and idea of the closet is so integral to the history of same-sex desire? Mm. Yes, absolutely. So the one of the crucial things about certain aspects of same-sex desire in many parts of the world today and for many parts of the world in the past is criminalization mm. and where same-sex acts were not criminalized same-sex relationships were not criminalized they have often faced considerable prejudice and misunderstanding so in those circumstances there are certain defensive reactions that people can, people, strategies that people can have. And one of them is degrees of secrecy. So you have to think carefully about who you tell and in what circumstances. And you also have to think about what stories you're going to tell to your family, to your work colleagues, um, to friends and so forth. So the idea of secrecy is really important for thinking about formations same sex, of same-sex desire in the past. Mm -hmm. And this term, mm -hmm. the closet, uh, came into prominence really at the time of uh, les what was then referred to as lesbian and gay liberation in the 1960s and 1970s. And it was framed in terms of coming out from a place of secrecy. So my work has largely focused on the period before those kind of civil rights movements of the post-war period and therefore engaging with secrecy, engaging with things like the closet are really important for understanding lives. So Dominic, what do you think are the links between the closet as a physical space and as a visual metaphor, its usage referring to those who are secretive, about mm. their same sex desires? Yes. So one thing I should say here is that my work, because I, I work across the boundaries of, of history and history of art, mm. uh, I even call it visual culture. So I think quite visually, right? And I think for studying the the closet as a space, thinking visually is really quite important because it actually derives as a term from physical spaces. And there are two major aspects to that. One of them was the development of a room that was referred to as a closet. And this happened in the kind of the early modern period. And the closet was a place, I suppose the modern equivalent would be a little bit like a home office 
It's where you go to do some serious stuff in private. And the closet there for was somewhere where you, you might, for example, in the early modern period, the serious stuff that you might do is pray to God, for example. Mm. Or you might read or you might do your business dealings. And the person who was actually allowed into your secret space, your closet mm. in your house, was often referred to as a secretary. That's the person who keeps your secrets. So one route of the closet is actually out of that. The other route of the term, the closet, is mm. out of another development of kind of home decor, which is due to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And the development in the United States of a costume closet. And this is particularly associated with women. And this being the place where you, you store you stored your finery and so the idea of the closet and coming out of the closet uh, was had a sort of double meaning there's the initial meaning of you step out of the space and you leave your secrets behind in the closet and then there's the kind of gay and liberation notion of coming out of the closet which is where actually you dress yourself up in the clothes that you keep in your closet and you appear in your kind of full finery. And there was a kind of camp edge to this because it was mm -hmm. often used, for example, by um, gay men to kind of sort of and a kind of punning way to kind of associate themselves with being, you know, girls dressing up when they're going to go to school prom or you know the british equivalent would be being debutantes basically in the 50s and suddenly arrive on society so you'd come out of the closet and then you make yourself known in the gay community and by extension then you might actually come out of the closet and make yourself known to friends family colleagues etc so, I mean, we've touched there on secrecy and denial. Um, mm. But what about um, in, the, in, in terms of the closet? But what about before the term the closet? Um, how, mm. how is the visual expression expressed then? Okay, so, right. So the term the closet is around from the early modern period. Mm -hmm. For its use, with a particularly sort of, if you want to say, um, a gay or, or lesbian sense, that is post-war. But if you're looking previously, what you have is an interesting question of how did people who identified as homosexual or before that time came into use, they might have identified as a sodomite, for example, um, a sapphist, there's a whole range of different terms that people, or a molly in the 18th century, a whole range of terms that people might have used for themselves, which express some form of gender or sexual nonconformity. Mm -hmm. uh, how did those pe people show themselves in public, and, or how were they identified and pictured? So the issue is this, that in a time when desires are actually criminalized or there are all sorts of religious taboos or whatever else it is it's often very dangerous to actually put things down in writing mm. i am mm. this i am so and so and so what happens is that people adopt certain forms of costume they adopt certain mannerisms they adopt certain um places that they might visit which form a kind of visual set of clues that this might be someone who's interested in a same-sex romance or a same-sex encounter and there are some terrific accounts from for example the 17th and 18th centuries of uh, hostile newspaper reviewers saying these people 
can be known by this. They do these particular gestures, they go to these particular places, they wear their hair in this particular way. So what you get is a kind of visual language which is hinting at sexuality without completely committing you to say, this is what I am. Because if you get into a difficult uh, set of circumstances, you can deny things. Mm. But if you can get, get somewhere where uh, you meet other people who seem to be answering you with the same gestures, who seem to understand your visual language, et cetera, et cetera, that forms a basis for saying, can we now start talking in words about who we are and what we are? So a secret language, fascinating. Exactly. So why do you think it's um, important to note that the idea of the closet should not just be viewed um, as sites of oppression, but also um, at times mm. of creative opportunity? Mm. Well, exactly. So the, the thing here is that um, when there were very, very strong movements for people to, quote, come out of the closet, and here I'm talking about the 1960s, the 1970s, and also the 1980s. Um, those movements were, they were very strident, and quite often they had to be strident, because they were often dealing with life and death situations. So I'll give you an example um, that when I came out <laughs> of the closet, right, not commenting on exactly how I dressed at the time. But anyway, this is 1990, and this is right in the context of um, the AIDS crisis. Now, of course, many parts of the world still have an AIDS crisis, right? So I'm not saying it's over, but you know, 1990 was before uh, highly active antiretroviral therapies and so mm. forth. And this is, this is a period when calming out was a major political statement. And it was also associated with something called outing, the politics of outing. And this is where it's not just a question of you deciding for yourself that you're going to come out, but that other people out you. Quite often, this was aimed at people who were seen to be impeding human rights, lesbian and gay rights, lawyers, politicians, clergy and so forth. So there was a whole period when the whole thing was, the politics of outing and being in the closet became, and I'm using the word toxic, it became something that was really highly politicized. To actually be in the closet was associated by a lot of activists with being kind of a bit shameful. Now, okay, I really understand all of that. And to some extent, you know, I was I was there, even if I was relatively young, I was a student at the time. Um, mm. But if I go back in time, and I'm thinking about the late 19th century, or the early 20th century. So, you know, I've written quite a lot about Oscar Wilde and his circle. And I've got a new book, um, Freak to Chic, which is about Cecil Beaton and his circle in the 1920s and the 1930s. Most of those, most of those people weren't out of the closet. And perhaps they couldn't really be out of the closet because no one would have given them work. Um, they wouldn't have been able to put on their plays. They wouldn't have been able to have great careers. And so there was almost a kind of necessity for them to be how can I put this nuanced about how they presented themselves? So they could be out to themselves, they could be out to limited circles of people, but most of the time they had to kind of step away from being absolutely um, overt and obvious. And that's one of the things that's really interesting about the sort of Oscar Wilde, for example, before his trials of 1895, that people had been gossiping about his sexuality for 15 years and making some pretty unsubtle innuendo. But on the surface, most of the time, Wilde is maintaining that 
he's just as, uh, he's just posing he's just doing a particular artistic stance he's not coming out in the modern sense and in a sense really he's outed by the trials of 1895 but i don't want to condemn oh. him but i don't want to condemn him sorry i just got to mm. have a final little thought there i absolutely don't want to condemn him for not kind of being more overt at an earlier stage you know, he's working with the landscape that he had at the time fascinating yep a very public outing is what i was going to say um dominic yeah. your book picturing the closet argues that various mm. kinds of gendered performance such as camp have been used by queer men mm. to hint at their sexuality can you tell us how that worked and why it took place yes and um, there's something also here um that there's also another um tradition which is about various forms of female masculinity and the degree mm -hmm. to which those <clears throat> might have been used by by lesbians for example in the past um uh picturing the closet the book that that i wrote um i was writing as a man from male experience and um what i did in that book is basically to to think about run a kind of thought experiment really so imagine that i was living in the 17th century the 18th century the 19th century the early 20th the late 20th century and i had a certain set of desires that i was aware of towards other men what would i what would i do about that and how might i be seen and one of the major ways in which people men who feel you know desire for other men have been characterized in british culture and the book is primarily about britain but it applies to many other parts of the world as well is as it's as being some kind of gender hybrid so that there's an explanation there are various explanations that have floated around for homosexuality um, and one of them is that homosexuals are kind of somewhere between men and women and if that's the case that maybe there should be some visual signs of this now that's a stereotype and it's not at all clear that there's any kind of scientific validity to it. But as soon as you have that as a belief, you have an opportunity to play up to it. So, for example, you know, if you want to, um, if you want to um, adopt a certain code of behaviour that was referred, that's been referred to as camp, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, some people have talked about camp as basically mean sort of it's just copying, it's men copying women. But actually, I think camp really is about a kind of strategic exaggeration about how you perform yourself, which may latch onto certain aspects of gender. So if you're very self-conscious about whether someone is going to identify you as say gay or lesbian or not one of the things you can modulate is your behavior to be quote more feminine or more masculine as part of your kind of communication strategy so the main thing i'd say here is a lot of what i'm studying is really about performance and how people kind of construct themselves through performance rather than uh, a kind of notion that there's any kind of you know biological or psychological innate masculine masculinity or femininity to people who are bisexual or homosexual or lesbian or whatever term you want to use so dominic moving on to the visual art of the film mm. the liberace biopic behind the candelabra oh yes. michael Doug yes it's very perceptive oh, yes. in showing how the idea of the closet works 
um, of hiding in plain sight and communicating via mm. coded language, things that we've touched upon already. Could you tell us more about this and elaborate further on it? Mm. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, oh, one thing, I mean, I, I don't get any <laughs> endorsement for uh, any kickbacks from endorsing any particular films or whatever, but uh, the film Behind the Candelabra is very interesting on lots of different levels. Uh, and it's a film that could only have been made relatively recently because of, I think, the frankness with which it explores not just, you know, camp and dressing up, but also same-sex desire, sexual behaviour, um, age differential relationships, all sorts of kind of controversial issues, promiscuous sex, um, which I think, you know, at the time, we're looking back, the time when Liberace was, was around, this would have been too too dangerous to actually, you know, put into a film. Um, so it's a very brave film for doing all of this. It's also a, it's also a very funny film, which is great. So you might as well be entertained if you're going to actually watch a film. Um, uh, but the main thing, I guess, with, with Liberace is that I get the feeling that he was a kind of a representative of a an earlier cultural tradition. And this is a cultural tradition where someone who is, say, for example, a gay man, finds that they do have a talent for spectacular performance, but they have to be very careful because of all of the stuff that I've talked about, about in terms of prejudice. So if you're someone who enjoys spectacular performance, you'd better find a good place to do it, like, for example, politics, or in this case, um, the stage. So this is what Liberace does. He makes a kind of virtue of necessity. He creates a completely, I mean, a deliberately over the top performance. And there's an alibi because the audience watching can say, well, it's just a performance. And therefore the very fact that it's so extreme means that it's obviously fake. And therefore, we don't need to draw any sexual conclusions from it. Mm. So it's a very mm. spectacular example of um, kind of almost kind of making an almost spectacle of the closet. So it's, it's so obvious that you think everyone has to recognise it. And yet somehow it goes without being recognised. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's so over the top, completely. It's fascinating. So why, oh, yes. did, why do you think the fledgling um, gay rights movement of the 60s and early 70s increasingly viewed Liberace with antipathy? Uh, yeah, yeah. OK, so one of the major uh, themes of liberation at that date was the sense of stepping away from stereotypes. And one of those stereotypes was of the, the man-woman, you know, the masculine uh, lesbian or the feminine gay man. So there were some people who thought, that's great. That's what I am. Part of liberation is being able to be who you want to be, whatever shape or form that is. And that was a certain strand in it. But there was another strand, um, which was certainly quite strong amongst certain groups of, of gay men, which mm. the agenda of which mm. was very much about reclaiming masculinity and saying that it's not incompatible with homosexuality or gayness or, again, whatever term you actually want to use. Mm. So that what a lot of uh, people who are involved in liberation wanted to see was, was for example, overt masculinity combined with same-sex desire and open political statements of commitment to, for example, reform of anti-gay laws. So from that kind of perspective, Liberace is kind of almost the other pole of behaviour. 
Yeah. So it it appears to be all about entertainment rather than political commitment. It seems to be about taking a stereotype and living up to the stereotype rather than challenging the stereotype. Mm-hmm. And one other thing is also, I think we do have to bring this in as well, is that Liberace made an awful lot of money out of these performances. And there was another element of the, what was then referred to as the lesbian and gay uh, liberation movement, which was very tied into basically socialist and left-wing politics that saw itself allying with people of Mm -hmm. colour, with working class communities. And so that kind of politics is not the sort of thing that wanted to ally itself with someone who spends their time earning huge amounts of money in Las Vegas. No, indeed. (laughs) So moving on to the eighth Dominic. Um, mm. And we've touched on politics there a bit in your last answer, but what mm. did the idea of the closet come to represent or symbolise in the context of the conservative anti-gay backlash that took place mm. during the AIDS crisis in mm. the 1980s? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, this is something that I've, I've touched on already because it's, you know, it, it's part of my uh, my history. And um, and it's difficult for me right now to to talk about a kind of um, a kind of a backlash in relation mm. to the nineteen eighties without thinking about certain parts of the world where there's a a backlash going on now. Um, but I think you know the the eighties in many parts of the world were a very challenging time. And I remember the 80s, I remember being a teenager in the 80s. And it was a time which kind of encouraged reactions amongst teenagers of, are you going to really conform or are you going to really rebel? So I remember when I was at my sixth form college, I had the common room and they had each wall it was kind of rather kind of concretey space quite frankly (laughs) Um, and it was painted up uh, with a kind of concrete bench around the walls and each wall was a different color now nowadays we probably look at the colors and go whoa that's a rainbow that's diversity but back then we weren't thinking like that we just thought okay they've just tried to make it a bit more interesting by having different colors anyway the cool kids And I was in the closet and I was, I mean, however wonderfully cool I am now, I wasn't back then. Anyway, the cool kids, they basically sat in black leather on the black painted concrete underneath the black wall and were punk and gothic. That was that was kind of the the kind of the oppositional thing. So when I moved on from sixth form uh, and went to university and started to kind of think hmm maybe i could sort of rebel in in very genteel and minor <laughs> swattish kind of history student ways um and um and got myself a buzz cut for example uh which is a, a scary thing but it's actually you know there in in some of the pictures of the of the time um i was uh starting to step into a community that was quite strongly politicized and was politicized because of some of the actions of Margaret Thatcher's government in the UK and Ronald Reagan's government in the US and the actions of other governments elsewhere and was politicized because of the particularly in the US, a kind of slow adaption uh, towards a positive government response towards the AIDS crisis. While all of this was happening, um, leading scholars such as Eve Sedgwick, um, Judith Butler in the US, are establishing queer theory as a field. And none of this was on the university curriculum at this stage, but I would go along to a study group 
where we would kind of get some of the latest texts in from California or New York. Um, and we would sit there and, uh, and, and think that we sort of understood them ish, if you see what I mean. Um, so all of that was the kind of the environment, uh, in, a, in a way, quite a tough environment that I came out into. And also, I just really want to emphasize this as well, that I think most of us were, um, were very scared. So it's not just the kind of I'm scared because it's a time of high unemployment and am I going to get a job and, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff. It's just the fact that, you know, substantial numbers of people, you know, Liberace included, uh, have died or are going to die uh, of, of AIDS. And at that stage, it wasn't entirely hammered out who it was going to affect, whether it was going to become a, a kind of, you know, not just what the newspapers referred to as a gay plague, but something that was actually going to mm -hmm. engulf you know, the whole of society. So a very, very intense time, which made a big impact on my thinking, but it mm -hmm. didn't kind of make an impact on my studies for several, for several more years. about your personal experience of coming out in the 1980s mm. and I can't imagine you not being cool but anyway moving on to the media do you think that the media shapes or is shaped um, by public opinion and LGBT mm. issues mm. yeah well this is this is an interesting one isn't it um, because again linking to that last question one of the things that we around the you know the early 90s were very very concerned with was the media and the sense that most of the print media well the print media in britain is very powerful mm. uh and and very prejudiced by yes. and large right yes. uh and particularly the ta tabloid media and you know uh the sun for example would be printing millions of copies of extremely anti-gay anti-lesbian material which was just kind of you know from our point of view spewing out on a day-to-day -day basis um the kind of visual media things like the bbc and channel four well it was slow going <laughs> but slowly uh you did actually start to get positive engagements with what we now talk about as lgbtq issues uh both through documentaries and very slowly with dramas and slowly occasionally non you know straight heterosexual characters in in soap operas and so forth so i grew up with this very very strong feeling of you know the media is dangerous actually mm. and they're really fanning prejudices but you know i mean there is the whole issue of of audiences here and there must be a kind of dynamic relationship between you know the media and the audiences particularly a uh, commercial media who obviously yeah. have a, an immediate yeah. pressure to make sure that keep people keep on buying their products it's an interesting one not to shift on to another discussion but you know, yeah. for example, yeah. around um, the Brexit referendum, you know, it's very heavily debated to what extent where an issue is narrowly balanced. Can the media just nudge five, 10 percent of people from one side of the argument to the other? And actually, that radically yeah. changes our future. So that was that was my feeling about the media, really. Is that actually there are a lot of people out there who don't necessarily take it that seriously or don't agree with it but i think there's enough people whose opinion can shift and whose perception of the center ground uh can be influenced and that's where i think media can be very powerful for a force well i'm going to be opinionated here right so force for good or force for bad no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the questions are piling up, Dominic. So um, we'll be coming to those oh, very wow. shortly. Yeah, just a few questions. Okay. 
me firstly um coming to the present now um yeah you know, we've looked at the history of global liberation but what does the idea of liberation mean and signify for you today um it's this is a really really interesting question for me because in radical politics liberation has been so important and we're thinking about the ideals of the american mm. revolution however imperfect it was right not claiming it's perfect but you know many of the ideals mm. and of the french revolution and again yeah. stepping away yeah. between the question of what the ideals are and then what actually how the reality plays out mm. so there's a very long history of uh, of radical thought and progressive thought which basically says a lot of people have been limited unnecessarily um, they've been tied down in all sorts of different ways sometimes physically literally shackled right uh chain gangs but some but also a lot of the time mentally and kind of emotionally and being kept under control and that sometimes has helped society become more stable but it also means that people aren't questioning uh those who are in authority and people aren't necessarily able to grow to their full potential so liberation is for me heavily to do with insofar as you can fulfilling your full potential um and without you know and obviously there are bounds to this you know in terms of uh, you have to do this in association with other people. We're not talking about trampling on other people's uh, property and all this kind of stuff. So for me, for example, liberation might mean being able to think and reflect and develop my ideals and ideas as fully as I can in the time that I'm, that I'm given. So I can have all of that. Of course, when you come to the practicalities, there are all sorts of ways in which this kind of liberation is tricky now. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to keep thinking about uh, LGBTQ and liberation as an issue. To step away from the notion that kind of all of these uh, issues are kind of sorted and settled. Legislation has arrived. There's nothing much else to say. Whereas, in fact, there are all sorts of ways in which it can be very difficult for alternative points of view to be heard. People can say, for example, well, OK, there isn't really a big enough market on a major TV channel to have um, it's a sin. I wouldn't dig at any particular channel, but you know, there was some debate about which channel was going to produce that, right? Mm. Um, or publishers could say, well, LGBTQ, it's interesting, but it's marginal. Only a small group of people are going to be interested in that. So one way I frame that is to say, the issue of being able to fulfill your potential intellectually, emotionally, sexually, right? Is something mm which should be important to everyone. And therefore, if you like the LGBTQ struggle, if you want to call it that, is exemplary of the way in which all sorts of different people can look around and say, things could be better. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, move on to politics just very briefly. Why do you think, Dominic, <laughs> that LGBT plus issues and activism identify primarily with the left? Mm. Yes. Well, OK, now this is a very this is another really interesting one here. Um, so. My my understanding of. The areas of the past that, that I've, I've studied, which is particularly Britain and its connections with with a range of other cultures with which it's interacted. 
so the United States, with France, with British presence in, in India and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, there are different points in history where various forms of same-sex desire can be located in different bits of the social spectrum. Uh, that there's nothing intrinsic to one particular class, as far as I understand it, uh, or one particular social group that makes it more likely that you will have gay men there or lesbians there or bisexuals or people who identify as queer nowadays. OK, so one of the questions then is exactly the one that you pose, which is how come a certain political slant gets associated with a, a group of people and a cause. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the, the story here is to do with some of the stuff that I'm talking about, that I've been talking about already, which is about the civil rights movement. And that the, the view of people who were opposed to the civil rights movement is not uniform. There were some people who were <laughs> racist, misogynist, uh, homophobic, um, who objected to it on those grounds. Um, there were other people who didn't think they were like that, who basically mm. thought that the existing way of doing business was fine. And that, for example, issues of sex and sexuality belonged in the private sphere. And this is part of what we've referred to as the closet, keeping it private. Mm. And that I'm just starting a new research project, which I suppose could be badged, you know, the queer establishment, which kind of looks at the ways in which the British um, establishment contained queerness within it from the 18th, 19th, the 20th centuries as a kind of a closet, right, for certain people, where you were allowed to have a certain kind of discreet life but you weren't allowed to question hierarchy. You weren't allowed to join in with, for example, a kind of socialist idea of undermining the aristocracy, undermining the monarchy, all this kind of stuff. Now, one of the things about that subject position is that it's a bit static. It's rather disempowering. It kind of says, well, you can sort of exist, but only in very limited bounds. It doesn't really fit, it certainly doesn't fit with liberation, which is about changing the bounds of possibility. Mm -hmm. So in the mid 20th century, when people looked around to change the bounds of possibility, um, they were often looking not to a conservative party whose job was to conserve the status mm -hmm. quo, Conservative parties changed rather a lot, as we all know, since then. But they were looking to a radical politics, um, which wanted to question all sorts of different aspects of society. And so what's really important here is that the, the gay and liberation, gay and lesbian liberation movement emerged in the context of women's liberation, uh, mm. in the context of black power. And it's those group of different kind of identities and identity politics which have moved through to the present day, were re-energized by a kind of radical queer movement from the 1990s onward. People who said that, you know, categories of gay, lesbian were too sort of rooted and, and had become too normative and they wanted to step beyond that. And right the way through to the present day, we've got a situation where um, there is an opposition quite often in politics between a left, which is engaging with identity mm -hmm. of these sorts of na natures, as opposed to a right that is focusing on other aspects of identity, for example, the nation or certain mm -hmm. forms of religion. So. Just to sum all of that up, I don't think there's anything intrinsically necessarily left wing about being LGBTQ, but there's a whole set of political conditions 
that have kind of tied those two together. I just want to ask you very briefly, Dominic, just about something that's very much connected to your last answer, but about the rise of the mm. right wing populism and authoritarian tendencies mm. um, that have happened, particularly across Eastern Europe. Um, how have LGBT mm. plus rights become politicized, politicized sorry, and repressed within this mm. context? And then we will move on mm. to questions. Mm. Yeah, so very. So very quickly, <laughs> because obviously with a lot of this, there's so much that could be said and and, and, and discussed. Um, yes, absolutely. So there, there, there are certain countries around the world where laws are being brought in, which are limiting um, the behaviour in various ways of LGBTQ people. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I know about it from friends. I, you know, scan the media. And, you know, to read that there are towns in certain countries in Eastern Europe where the local council declared them to be, you know, quote, gay free mm -hmm. is, is, well, it, it's horrifying, right? Because yeah. that yeah. occurs with not just a kind of, you know, discrimination against a particular group. But it has horrible sort of echoes of a you know of a of a part of a world an aspect of the past which is about cleansing the community of its impure elements and this is the world of the pogrom this is the world of i mean at its worst it's about elimination actually um and that's very frightening to me that that kind of politics is alive. Now, one other area which is controversial, and it's one that I have written about, because I wrote a book, Visions of Queer Martyrdom, which was about the overlaps between homosexuality and, um, and Catholicism, is the issue of religion and the degree to which different world religions have been presented as anti-gay, anti-lesbian. And it's a big debate here. Um, there are theologians of a wide range of views within Christianity. There are a very wide range of views between all the other different world religions, but there are major strands within many of the world religions which have been very hostile mm -hmm. to same-sex uh, romance and love and sex. And there are politicians out there who are weaponizing this. Uh, and that's when it can get very dangerous indeed. Dominic, thank you so much. Oh, we will yes. go to really, really fascinating, fascinating answers. Um, Ira is asking, recently James Corden has been criticised for his role in the film Prom, where he, as a straight man, plays a flamboyant, feminine gay man with great interest in fashion and Broadway. What are your thoughts on such stereotypes being portrayed in popular culture? Um, is it necessarily problematic? Okay. Uh, mm. Okay. So I think my first answer is it's not necessarily problematic, <laughs> but it can be a bit problematic. Yes. Um, so there are a couple of different issues here. One of them is the question of the identity of the actor in question. Um, so that it may be one thing for someone who is a member of a community to perform being a member of that community. That's one thing. But then there are some there might be some sensitivities that someone who's perhaps not from that community mm -hmm. um, may produce a, a stereotype which connects with traditions that are you know, not based on your kind of um, kind of self performance and gentle mocking humor and all this kind of stuff, but are actually mm. based on, on attacks, a stereotype yeah. which is yeah. intended to be a negative stereotype. So I think my answer here is I don't think there's in, inherently anything wrong about flamboyance or non flamboyance, nothing inherently wrong about anywhere on the gender spectrum, right? Uh, it's more, I think, a question of 
um, who's doing the performance and have they thought carefully before they do it. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Um, Bella Dominic is asking, why do you think that feminine masculinity in the lesbian community is less visible in film and why is it not being represented in the same positive light? Mm. That's this is really this is really interesting. So um, there are a range of um, again different performance positions, should we say, and different gender mm -hmm. positions, right? Mm -hmm. So we have we have the issue of people who uh, believe binary, uh, sorry, that gender is binary. There are other people who believe that gender is not binary. That gender is is it a spectrum, for example. Yeah. And then you have the question of performance and whether performance it needs to be quote authentic or not so in other words you could say right um i am intrinsically uh a a man who's very in touch with certain aspects of culture that traditionally have been thought of as being women's interests and all this kind of stuff um uh now you know I, for example, think that it just happens to be culture that's often associated fashion with women rather than men, for example. I don't think it's necessarily hardwired. Um, mm. But I think in terms of the, the resulting performances that people see, it's quite interesting that some of them are approved and some of them a little harder to sell. So, for example, the idea of being uh, a woman and being feisty, well, that's, that sells, right? A lot of people go, yeah, I can get along board with that. But if the feistiness starts to become overt masculinity, then some people get a little bit uneasy and they kind of go, what is that? Does that mean lesbianism? Does it not mean lesbianism? What does it actually mean, right? And again, you get the same thing kind of rolled back in relation to um, male performance. So one yeah. thing that I think is really interesting is the popularity of uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, for example, and the notion that the kind of drag that's done on the Drag Race is, quotes very uh, feminine, very femi sort of thing. And and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, actually, a lot of what's going on there is very feisty, right? Whether you want to use the term femi or feisty or whatever, there's a box of different terms that you can apply to what is going on there. My own personal position, by the way, is um, I quite like the term queer because it basically, it's a little bit allows a thousand flowers to bloom, whatever. But I can understand that in terms of popular culture, there are certain performances, certain blends of gender that people find a little more difficult to accept. Yeah, interesting. So another question, this time from Graham, who asks, um, he, he says he's very interested in your points on how visual art was used as a way to allude to sexuality without creating a written record. What examples would you suggest from the 18th, 19th century, European art and all the British Empire? Wow, gosh. <laughs> well, I mean, the well, cop out, well, the cop out, the cop out is right, go and buy my book and then it, you have a long list of these wonderful things that you can have a look through. Um, and uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> one interesting, but, but, but one rather cheaper version of, of, of this, for example, um, is um, there's, there's a very interesting stuff about Hogarth, mm -hmm. William Hogarth. So William Hogarth is, you may be familiar with him. If you're not, he is 18th century artist. He makes a lot of money by um, pioneering print culture and selling his works, showing basically scenes of chaotic everyday life in 18th century London. And I, one of the chapters of the book talks about a particular Hogarth painting called The Gate of Calais, mm -hmm. which overtly is all about food. 
it's all about British beef. And the idea is that the French are not properly fed because they eat silly French food. It's very, very nationalistic, Hogarth, right? Whereas <laughs> beef is the sort of thing that makes you grow up big and strong. Mm -hmm. And there's a rather phobic representation of a Roman Catholic uh, monk uh, grabbing hold of a magnificent side of British beef and lurking around in that image is all sorts of innuendo about because beef in the 18th century rather like now beefcake actually meant you know male muscle as well There's all sorts of interesting innuendo lurking around about desires hidden desires what you can say what you can condemn and i also identified that um Hogarth, when he was painting this work uh, or painting, doing the sketches on which the work was later based, he was actually in Calais and he became kind of paranoid that French people were staring at him and uh, French men were staring at him and eyeing him up. So there's an awareness of same sex desire going on within Hogarth, which he doesn't know what to do with. And so he right. paints it out in this way. Anyway, there are lots of different examples I could use, but that's just one. That's a good one. It's a good example. Um, another, this from Kerry, Dominic. Having studied oh. the history and meaning of coming out of the closet, do you feel that society in which coming out as any sexuality loses the importance of the history? Do you think, um, sorry, I've, I've misread it there. Coming out as any sexuality is no longer necessary and it loses the importance ah. of the history okay right okay hmm okay so this one i'm going to dodge dodge again by saying yes and no <laughs> so on an individual level i'm not going to say it's necessary right because that's all about the individual what is appropriate for you and appropriate mm -hmm. as i think a much better word than say necessary mm -hmm. On another level, if you're talking about society as a whole, then maybe there is, it is still useful to actually talk about certain things being necessary. And the reason why I want to say that is that there are strands of opinion out there that advocate the kind of notion that LGBTQ people are a basically a very, very small minority, that they don't count. Whereas I think the greater freedoms that many people, not everyone, but many people have had over recent dec decades, have started to bring to the fore that people have very diverse life experiences and desires. You have people who might identify as one thing when they're younger and then identify as something else later in life. They may change their ideas. They may decide they don't want to have an identity. There's a lot of flexibility. But I think if everyone basically says, this needs to be my own personal matter and I'm not going to go public about this and I'm not going to uh, flag up issues, which have come from my own personal convictions, right, on the public sphere, there's a danger that those freedoms are going to start becoming limited because they'll just be ignored, right? So you won't just be left in peace, you'll be left in a world where you're not respected. And as soon as you're not respected, um, whether you think it's a necessity to be public or not, that is going to impact on, that is immediately going to impact on you. So I think there still is a kind of political sense in which actually maybe debating some of this stuff is good. And if you've got stuff to talk about, yes, come out and talk about it. Dominic, we're sadly running out of time. But I just want to ask you one final question. Okay. Um, from one of, from the audience. Do you think the idea of the closet will ever go away?
Oh gosh. <laughs> right. So the one thing that historians should never do is to try to forecast the future. Um, okay. I think that cultural concepts like the closet are rooted in certain times and places. So this thing that I've called the closet in picturing the closet that I've written about, I don't think that's always going to be there. However, some of the same underlying issues, which are about knowledge, self-knowledge, um, performance, all these kind of things, um, until you know we've evolved into something post-human and very different, those stuff are mm. still going to be very important to us. Dominic, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating hour. Um, it's been a delight and so interesting. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much uh, for, uh, for all your questions. And just to remind you um, that the next event is on Thursday, March the 18th with Professor Emma Griffin on women, families and money in Victorian Britain. Details are available on the British Academy website. So thanks again to Dominic and thank you very much.